Hi everyone, my name is James Feeney. Welcome to or back to my channel. Today I thought I would film outside because it's so nice. I was just feeling very inspired to be outdoors. So I'm in my backyard. You might hear wind, you might hear the sounds of my pool, you might hear neighbors, but I just thought this would be a fun idea, a very informal sort of video, something that was inspired by my daily draw today. As you may know, I do a daily draw of a tarot card from the Thoth Tarot every single day, and today I got the Magician, or the Magus, in the Thoth Tarot. Now I can't find this card, I usually keep it right on the top, but I did shuffle this deck right before coming out here. So, I pulled the Magus, and I journal on it, I reflect on it, I usually read an excerpt of my card from the Book of Thoth, as well as other books that have uh, definitions and bits written on these cards. So, and so we have the magician. I was reflecting on this and Crowley in general, the idea of tarot and divination in general, and I began to really contemplate the whole purpose of and uses of tarot and divination. So, Crowley really originally didn't intend his deck for divination. He includes divinatory meanings and write-ups of each of the cards as they pertain to certain elements, but his he states even that he really didn't intend it to be used for divination. He really intended it to be used as a magical tool to illustrate essentially all that could be or the universe in this very esoteric, Kabbalistic, Golden Dawn sense, connecting in a lot of mythologies and traditions, and it's really meant to be this comprehensive guide. It's really meant to be like a tome of magic that is wrapped in symbolism and mystery to be understood and unraveled and worked with. And so I think I fall into the trap of seeing divination, tarot, and those sorts of things as separate from magic or my magical practice, and that I see my magical practice as something that's separate from this. Although the two seem very close, like they're cousins, they don't seem like the same thing. It seems like I'm either making a video about one, making a video about the other, or in my life I am doing magic or working with the cards, and they there's a disconnect, and that's really my perception. It's the way that I view it and choose to go about it. Uh, it's not the tools or the practices themselves that are inherently separate. In fact, I think tarot itself is a highly magical tool. It is magic. You can use it in magic. When you are working with the tarot, you are in a way conducting a magical practice and when you are conducting magic there are a lot of times when you are probably divining divining from within yourself divining in your outer world and so i wanted to just go through and maybe even delve into the how certain cards might be used magically what is really underlying there kind of going past that divi that divination and what we can use the core of the card magically speaking to do and to exemplify and how we might work with it so I have the, the Thoth tarot, but this isn't supposed to be exclusive to Thoth. The idea of working and using magic and tarot or cardamancy as magic is something that you, I think you can do with every deck. So I've also brought out the, you can't really see this in this light, it's the Brady tarot, the second edition. And so we're going to look at that too, because this is, a, I would say, very far removed from esoteric thoughts. It's very natural and pictorial and scenic and fluid. So I think there will be a lot of people who can relate more to decks that are very natural and are more fluid-like and don't have so much intense esoteric symbolism behind them. And I think that they're just as magic. So we're gonna look at both, but we're gonna start with the Thoth because I think it's a little bit easier to illustrate given that there's a lot of literature and a lot of literature that has explicitly magic verbiage used. So, we will start, I think this, the, the minor arcana is easier here because Crowley writes an awful lot on his majors along with the courts. So we're gonna start with a smaller, one of the smaller cards as he calls them, he calls them the small cards. I, I tend to see a lot of magical reference for the fives, just so these don't get blown away. Put it a little bit in the bag, okay. So we're gonna start with the five of swords. Now there's inherently astrological associations. So we have uh, Venus and Aquarius. If you are into astrology, you can turn you can turn that into magic. You know what Venus feels like. You know what Venus connotes. You know what Aquarius is and what its associations are. If you are at all interested in, say, the Kabbalah, you know that fives 
link to the Sephira, the yeah, the Sephira of Jibura, which is the fifth emanation. Sorry if that if I'm losing anybody in speaking about this who isn't interested in these topics, but you can already start to play on those things. There's this forcefulness. There's this drive. Uh, it feels very. I would say it feels like friction to me. The idea of Venus in the in Jibura, the the fifth Sephira, and the idea of Aquarius wanting to expand but maybe feeling that as though there's too much force. It's almost like mom and dad are fighting and Aquarius doesn't get to be seen. That's how it feels for me. So right there, there's a feeling and feelings to me are magic and a lot of magic starts from a feeling and so I like to identify what a card feels like and that's going to dictate how I might go about working with it magically. So when I feel things like friction, when I feel things like conflict and various incongruous elements, I'm already starting to, I would say, transmute those feelings into something more tangible. We also see the idea of a pentagram, an, an inverted pentagram upside down. So especially in concern, in where Crowley is concerned, this is like evil. This is where materiality has sort of bogged down any higher thinking or spirituality, where transcendence, uh, just because the, the fifth point or that top point is generally associated with the idea of spirit, that fifth element, that higher self, that divine above and beyond. And when it's inverted, it's, it's been bogged down, it's been weighed down, it's crash, burn, finito. So, <laughs> digging into the small card that is the five, five of swords. So the five of swords, the title is defeat. So you can also interact with things like keywords, which I think is interesting. Uh, so we have Jibura as always produces disruption, but as Venus here rules Aquarius, weakness rather than excess of strength seems to be the cause of disaster. The intellect has been enfeebled by sentiment. The defeat is due to pacifism. Treachery may also be implied. The hilt of the sword from the inverted pentagram, always a symbol of somewhat sinister tendency. Here, matters are even worse. None of the hilts resemble any of the others, and their blades are crooked or broken. They give the impression of drooping only to the lo uh, only the lowest of swords points upward, and this is the least effective of the weapons. The rose of the previous card has been altogether disintegrated. And I think my neighbor's doing some construction, so... The historian is happy to observe two perfect illustrations of the mode of this card. Okay, I won't get too into this. Um, all right, so we have that idea, of course, of that inverted pentagram and its connections. We have connections of, of course, those astrological and Kabbalistic elements. And so if I'm using this in magic, the, the idea of the, inf the, sent uh, the intellect enfeebled by sentiment is really interesting. So it's like, your mind has gotten the better of of the emotion. It's kind of bogged, or it's things are bogged down by the emotion. The intellect is bogged down by the emotion. So it's like someone's not necessarily in control of their feelings. They, they aren't processing them properly. And uh, we feel like we don't have control over the one thing we really do have control over, which is ourselves. So I might turn to this card to do magic that is concerned with getting back in the driver's seat, feeling in control of myself, of my inner, of my inner self, to interact with the ideas of emotions that cloud judgment. And so if I were to say do a spell to dispel or banish the, the emotions or the complexity and the fogginess in my head that is inhibiting my, my focus and my drive and my ability to see things clearly, I might use this card. I might use this as a focal point and I might play off of the ideas present here. So that's first and foremost what I might do. So this could even be something where you meditate on this and very consciously try to get in tune with what this means and what you're hoping to derive from it as its core meaning and then manifest that for yourself, whether that means lighting a candle, coming up with a little incantation, just consciously meditating, breathing, all of that. That's magic. So let's look at another one. We have got, I'm holding these all upside down too. We'll do one more of the Thoth, and then we're gonna look at the, we'll look at the Brady, Tar the Brady Tarot second edition. Okay, let's use, let's not do a sword. Let's pick something that's a little bit more, I mean, Crowley actually has a lot of tendencies to find the negatives in cards that I would generally find to be quite positive. So let's do, you know, we're gonna do 
the Eight of Discs. So we have Virgo, second deacon, which is ruled by the sun. Eights are ruled by Hod, so we have uh, Mercury present, the, the idea or the planetary association of Mercury and Hod, which is the, the eighth Sephira on the Tree of Life. So we have all of that going on. We're going to want to think of those things. Okay. Ace of Discs. Okay, so we have Prudence, Eight of Discs. The number eight, Hod, is helpful in this card because it represents Mercury in its most spiritual aspect. And, and he both rules and is exalted in the sign of Virgo. So we have a lot of really nice linking parts here. There's this brightness, this airiness, this above... Bug. <laughs> I don't know if you guys saw that. A bug, like, crash landed on me. But we have that... We have all of these really almost synchronistic things linking together that mesh really well, that play into each other's strengths. So it's like the dream team coming together, but really more in that intellectual driven manifested sense. So is exalted in Virgo, which belongs to the deacon and is governed by the sun. It signifies intelligence lovingly applied to material matters, especially those of the agriculturist, the artifice, and the engineer. So this one's a little bit more straightforward. This would be something where I'm looking to complete a project. I'm looking to have something seen through to fruition. I want to remain focused. I want all of the, the moving parts that go into manifesting anything to play out to their, their best ability. So I'm going to focus on something like this. The harmony that comes with a lot of, a lot of, I would say, intellect that is combined with uh, materiality and intelligence and clarity of thought so take that how you will so all of these it's like each one is its own very specific sigil that has multiple or infinite uses given how you choose to look at them and so this to me is this is a gigantic pack of sigils for sigil magic at the same time uh, so it's perfect for that if you are interested in such things now this deck lends itself very I would say overtly to ideas of practicing magic and of course Crowley was more of a ceremonial magician so I think he would almost gawk at the idea of doing something as simple as looking at a card and just trying to meditate or breathe about it he would want something more elaborate to happen to have something happen he would yeah so <laughs> but that's that's him that's not me so we now have the Brady Tarot second edition and we'll look at a few cards and maybe what we can do there so. okay let's see let's pick an example all right here's one so we have the four of i believe it's horns is it the four of horns horns are cups right if i'm wrong could be wrong but basically the four of cups and the key word here is apathy so this is a natural deck with keywords which is really beautiful so we get a lot of it feels peaceful it feels tranquil we have the bugs are attacking me we have the bison or buffalo the ox that is discontented it's not very happy with its current circumstances but nothing appears to be wrong and there are birds flitting about drinking out of the cups that the bison the ox i would have to look at the book is not concerned with and so as far as working with this in a more intuitive, magical sense, one might turn to this when they are feeling dissatisfied to reflect on and maybe to even have a spell to seek out fulfillment or at least to, to gain clarity on what the lack of fulfillment and the apathy that one is feeling entails. Uh, these are almost like, to me, they feel like little natural vignettes, portraits of a, an emotion and a scene that we can use to reflect or to unearth various feelings, thoughts, actions, and things that we would like to take place. So I would definitely turn to this card if I were feeling very sort of in that humdrum, dissatisfied state, and I was looking to say, understand why that is for the purposes of getting out of it or to find the fulfillment that I'm seeking and not currently feeling. We have cards like Celebration with the Three of Cups. And I feel like this is the kind of card that I would pull out before I go to meet up with my friends and almost have this little ritual to ensure that I'm in the right headspace and the right heart space to have a good time and to make sure that the, the gathering is 
meaningful and uplifting for all of us that there's this synergistic quality of combined emotions and so that would be some way that I might a little small magical ritual I might enact while using this card so again this is just a pack of cards of magic they're almost like ones that you can just draw out and use it on the go I like to use I would say tarot for uh, magic that involves deep breathing meditation conscious thought uh, intention, intention setting that is to be manifested, which is a magic of its own. And so we have all of that going on in the tarot. And I just wanted to hop on really quickly and share my reflections on that and to just have a little bit of a dialogue. I'm sure that this is something that a lot of people are already doing or very much aware of, but it can't hurt to remind everybody. I remind myself all the time that this is the case with tarot and that it's not separate from magic. In fact, it is magic itself and it's a magical tool just as much as it is this divinatory tool and divination in and of itself is mad is a magical act in my opinion so i hope that was enjoyable i hope you are all doing well i hope that the sound was the sound quality and light and all of that was all right let me know down below how you use cards divination for magic whether that be runes tarot oracle i'd love to know and i'd love to know your thoughts on that as well so i hope you're all well like and subscribe if this was fun for you and, and interesting or helpful. And until next time, bye everyone.